You can hear me, right? Okay. The two cartoon strips there by Bill Watterson. They appeared in 1995 and they show, I think, the prevailing attitudes at the close of the 20th century towards abstract art and also towards art in general. The comments you most frequently encounter when you see an abstract painting is, my five-year-old can do that. Well, not really, and perhaps after he or she has seen the painting. Another comment, a chimp or a chimpanzee can paint that. Yes, repetitiously under controlled circumstances by humans, especially in zoos that need extra income from the paintings on tote bags decorated by the animals. The third and last comment I will repeat is, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. A little investment in time will help clarify your likes and dislikes, which is what I hope to do today. The term abstract art is defined in a very general way in Wikipedia. Abstract art uses a visual language of color, line, shape, and form to create a composition that may exist with a degree of independence from reference to the visual world around us. The definition is a very general one, but it includes both representational and non-representational art. And for the purposes of this talk, I may use it interchangeably with modern art, referencing only Western art. Without some understanding of the various influences on artists and the evolution of abstract art from the closing years of the 19th through much of the 20th, it can be difficult to connect with modern art, especially since art changed dramatically after Impressionism. Much has been written about the movements that come after Impressionism, the isms. Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism, Dada, Surrealism, Symbolism, well, you get the drift. My talk will focus only on some of those painters who influenced many that followed through the years, and I have omitted many other forms of art as well. Installation, performance, body, land, assemblages, and others because of time constraints. Now important to the history of modern art, I have to mention the Bauhaus. The School of Art and Design founded in 1919 in Weimar, Germany, until it was closed by the Nazis in 1933. It had a short life, but it was famous for playing a key role in establishing the relationship between design and industrial techniques. And it also had artists and architects who taught there, who played an important role in breaking down the hierarchy between what was then known as the applied arts and the fine arts. And from my personal viewpoint, which I only state once. Much of the contemporary art that we see in museums and commercial galleries and art venues, they appear to be hybrids or extensions of the styles derived from the pioneers of these earlier movements, which I will try to zip through today. Um, yeah. Now, before Impressionism, took hold, there were painters who gave early indication that the academic way of one-point perspective was not the only way to paint. And one of them from the late 18th century was Joseph Millard William Turner, born in 1775, 1851. And the slide you see there is a detail that I took from a bigger painting called The Burning of the Houses of Parliament. This was painted in 1834. 1835, the fire was in 1834. Turner was one of England's greatest figures in the history of landscape painting. He was an artistic prodigy whose fame spread to Europe and America in his lifetime, and after his death, his achievements were ranked alongside the old masters. Yet his later paintings, with their chromatic brilliance and unusual composition, have drawn comparisons to more recent artists 
including the Impressionists and Abstract Expressionists. As you can see here in the second painting, which was called Rain, Steam, Speed, the Great Western Railroad, painted in 1844. Impressionism was basically a French phenomena. During the last quarter of the 19th century, Monet, Renoir, Sisley, Pissarro, these are household names to many of us today. They were all individuals with disparate ideas and attitudes, but united in their desire to achieve a greater naturalism in art. Their style was characterized by a light, colorful palette, often unmixed paints, applied directly onto a prepared white canvas. The bright surface enhanced the luminosity of each color and increased the broken, disharmonious appearance of the picture. And as you can see, this painting was done by Claude Monet, born 1840, died 1926. It was called Impression Sunrise painted in 1872, and it gave the name to the movement Impressionism. The next painting by Monet, I think, shows exactly what Impressionism is all about. I mean, the love of color, the brilliance of the color. What followed Impressionism rather naturally was post-Impressionism. There was another group of artists with diverse styles and ideals who became dissatisfied with the limitations of Impressionism. Cezanne, Seurat, Van Gogh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Gauguin, Villard. And here I will talk a little about Cezanne. Paul Cezanne, born 1839, died 1906. He was an early Impressionist, but he abandoned it in 1877, and he worked in comparative obscurity until he was in his mid-50s, when he was given a one-man show in Paris. In his mature years, he created paintings where the sense of depth and solidity existed not through conventional draftsmanship and perspective, but through extremely delicate variations of tone and by distorting natural appearances. This particular painting is Mont Saint Victor, seen from Bibimus, painted 1897, oil on canvas. The next one, and he did that scene on Mont Saint Victor many, many, many times, as with Still Life with Apples and Peaches, which is the title of this one, painted in 1905, and much beloved, I think. It's an oil and canvas, 40 by 32 inches. The painting depicts actuality and illusion, description and abstraction, reality and invention. It has what I call plastic volume, and the term refers to the fact that the objects in the still life have their own independent mass and exist as such on their own. Cezanne's work and ideas were a major factor in the genesis of Cubism and on Picasso and Braque, its two leading exponents. His subsequent influence has been profound, varied and enduring, and it earned him the title the father of modern art. We have to be aware, though, that the last quarter of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th between 1880 and 1914, there were many scientific and technological developments. Among these were the first incandescent light bulbs, the Kodak box camera, the movie camera by the Lumiere brothers, the recording of sound, the first voice transmissions, and so on. Understanding how light and sound traveled and the physical components of it affected the way artists perceived and worked in the changing world. And these developments came along with Albert Einstein's theory of relativity and Freud's fundamental studies on hysteria, that is the psychological state of one's mind. The age of steam passed into the age of electricity, 
And there was a sense of an accelerated rate of change in all areas of human discourse, including art. So taking the lead from Cezanne, Cubism emerged, and a few names spring to mind. Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, Fernand Leger, Juan Gris. Since the Renaissance, almost all paintings obeyed a convention, that a one-point perspective. Now, this supposes a certain way of seeing things, a generalization about the experience of seeing by someone who is motionless. But the statement, this is what I see, can be replaced by the question, is this what I see? And I'm quoting this from the art critic Barbara Rose. There is a hesitation about the position of a particular object if one is not motionless. This painting is by Fernand Leger, 18, born 1881, died 1955. And it's titled, The Card Players, painted in 1917. And it's quite large, it's four by six foot approximately, and oil on canvas. Now the age of machines must have fascinated him as well, as can be seen, because it incorporates a cubist approach. But he also took into account Cezanne's quote, which was, treat nature by means of the cylinder, the sphere, and the cone. Apart from technology, there was the art of other cultures. Japanese prints admired for their different handling of perspective and spatial configuration. They were collected by many of the Impressionist painters. African art as well, as 19th and early 20th century French travelers brought back curiosities, for example, ritual masks, exotic images of primitive tribes from their colonial outposts. And their influence can be seen in this example by Pablo Picasso. I'm sure you all are quite familiar with this particular painting. Picasso lived from 1881 and he died in 1973. And this one is Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. You have to pardon my French. I am not a French speaker. It was painted in 1907 and is eight by eight foot approximately. Again, a very large painting, oil on canvas. And below it, there is an African mask, a Gabon mask of wood and pigment. Picasso wanted to call this the Avignon Brothel. After a whorehouse he used to visit in Barcelona in his student days, the face of the woman in the upper left-hand corner closely resembles the mask shown below. This next painting, more than any other by Picasso, changed my attitude towards his work. When I first saw it as a tapestry in the 1980s, hanging then in the UN Secretariat, Secretariat building. This is Guernica, painted in 1937, 12 foot by 25 foot. It's really, really large. The painting evokes the horror of the bombing of a small town during the Spanish Civil War of 1939 and 1975 under the fascist dictator Franco. Here is a passage from the book, Shock of the New, by Robert Hughes. I thought his description was really worth quoting. Guernica is a powerful invective against violence in modern art, but it was not wholly inspired by war. Its motifs, the weeping woman, the horse, the bull, had been running through Picasso's work for years. And John Berger, an English art critic, wrote that Picasso could imagine more suffering in a horse's head than Rubens put in a whole crucifixion. The spiked tongue, the rolling eyes, the frantic splayed toes and fingers, the necks arced in spasm. It is a battle sarcophagus, recognizable as a messenger from the ancient world. The world of ideal bodies working in flat carved stone. According to Hughes, it is the last great history painting that took its subject from politics with the intention of changing the way people thought and felt about power. And for something lighter, 
This is Calvin on Cubism by Bill Watterson and his reassurance that reality is what we want to make of it. Yet another influence on artists during this period was children's art, ages around 4 to 12. Children are aware of visual realism and up to a certain age, around 14 years, they use highly simplified flat patterns and reductive description of forms. Paul Gauguin had expressed the thoughts of many artists then when he said, in order to produce something new, one must return to the original source, to the childhood of mankind. And from the turn of the century to the beginning of World War I, artists began to collect and exhibit children's art. Some of these artists took in some instances cues from them. For example, Paul Klee, Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Juan Miro, and Vasily Kandinsky. This painting is by Henri Matisse, born 1869, died 1954. It is an oil on canvas titled The Young Sailor. Matisse reportedly showed this work to Leo Stein and claimed that it was painted by his postman. He was apparently embarrassed to claim it as his, as it looked like a child's painting, with its simplified figure, flattened colors, and outlining. But later, he admitted he had done it himself. Matisse was a major 20th century figure, along with Picasso, who at various stages in his career absorbed Impressionism and Cubism, along with the reductive flat colors seen in children's paintings. And he once said that he wanted his art to have an effect of a good armchair on a tired businessman. This next painting is titled The Red Studio, painted in 1911, oil on canvas, six foot by seven foot. He brings you into the space with a box of crayons at the bottom of the painting there. Everything in the painting, the chair, the plant, the easels, the paintings, they are in a fictional space, a flat, modulated red space, a painting about a painting, art creating itself. But as he got older and it was more difficult to paint, Matisse did this one called Beasts of the Sea, 1950, and it is a collage five foot by five foot and a half by almost 10 feet. And it was done when he was too weak to stand at the easel. This is a large collage made of scissored out shapes of colored paper and it gives a feeling of an underwater world of reductive forms. Suggestions of water weeds, fish, seahorses. This next painting is by Paul Clay born 1879, died 1940. And for about a decade, Clay focused on the syntax of his childhood drawings. But by 1918, he began to concentrate on the iconography of childhood works, particularly his own. The goldfish was painted in 1925. It's not very large, it's 27 by 20 inches. And below is his childhood sketch of fishes, done in 1889, which means he was around 10 years old. Clay taught at the Bauhaus from 1921 to 1931, and he was a major influence on 20th century artists in his concepts on line, color, nature, and fantasy. And he moved between figuration and abstraction, and he is widely not acknowledged as one who stood outside the mainstream of art. And this person I think you all are also familiar with, Vasily Kandinsky, The Elephant, oil and cardboard, painted in 1909, 18 by 27 inches. Kandinsky exerted extensively from the drawings by children in his collection for his abstractions of 1908 through 1914, but he also altered them considerably. The elephant drawing, which I haven't put in here, was done by a child, which he had in his collection. But he also altered them en route to his paintings, giving them a more childlike appearance than the children themselves had done. 
He was one of the pioneers of abstract art, and by 1912, he was into pure abstraction, that is, non-representational art. Again, the next painting, Murmur with lo locomotive, oil on canvas, 37 by 40 inches, painted in 1911, and two children's, well, I guess I included only one, and a child's drawing of the locomotive below. In his art, I have to make a note here, because in his art, Kandinsky drew analogies between colors. To him, they meant spiritual context, sounds and line. And he was an accomplished musician who played cello and piano, and a friend of Arno Schoenberg, whose revolutionary atonality he equated with his own experiments in pure abstraction between 1911 and 1912. So to recap, the influences on abstract art, as I've illustrated so far, have been science and technology from the end of the 19th into the early 20th century, art of other countries, Africa, Japan, children's art, and finally, wars and political turmoil. And much as I would have liked to go into it, the artists, the emigre artists after World War II, James Soutin, Marc Chagall, Amadeo Maudigliani, if you're all interested, their paintings are worth a look. After World War I, during the years of 1915 and 1922, disillusionment set in. 10 million dead, 20 million wounded. Artists reacted with irony and cynicism, a revolt against traditional values. And one of the responses was to go to extremes, to shock people out of their complacency. And a breed of artists emerged who were starting to attack the very concept of art itself. And this gave rise to Dadaism, an irreverent, rowdy, revolution that set the trajectory of 20th century art. Dada means yes in Russian and rocking horse and hobby horse in French. And the next work is a familiar modernist classic. This is of, this is titled New Descending a Staircase, number two, painted in 1913, 58 by 35 inches and oil on canvas. And Marcel Duchamp, the artist who did this was born in 1887, died in 1968. It was painted earlier, before the war, in the cubist way, suggesting motion and rhythmic movement, movement of the human body. But this later work, Fountain, 1917, a porcelain urinal sign R. Mutt, was a ready-made commercial object. It involved wordplay. That is, R. Mutt. Mott was the owner of the shop that he bought it from. And Mutt referred to a popular cartoon character who was simple-minded and greedy. It was provocative. The urinal had obvious sexual implications. Duchamp was implying that the art world of 1917 was taking itself too seriously. And the main difference between this as a work of art and as a pissoir were orientation, environment, plumbing, and a label. And in that context, art can be anything one wanted it to be, anti-art. Duchamp had registered the name of the Armat uh, before he entered it into the show, but it was totally rejected by the outraged art community then. But this work is, by the way, it has disappeared now. They don't know what happened to the original. But I know there are, I am not sure of the number, six or 12 copies that have been sanctioned by Marcel during his lifetime that are around. Duchamp's iconic work set the stage in the history of modern art as it foreshadowed abstract art, pop, op, and especially conceptual art in its implication that the idea or concept is the basis of art and not the object. And in 2004, 
some 500 artists and historians must definitely have agreed with him because they voted it the most influential art of the century. And, uh, okay. Now, during the period of the 1920s and 30s, there was a movement in art and literature closely related to Dada, surrealism. It was characterized by a fascination with the bizarre, the incongruous, and the irrational. And of course, Salvador Dali springs to mind, but um, I will discuss someone else. Juan Miro, born 1893, died 1983. In Spanish, Miro means he saw. He was a surrealist, although he hated being called that. In the 1950s, his work was more or less that of a surrealist. But he has con contributed to abstract expressionism and also to its counter movements. This painting is titled Harlequin's Carnival, painted 1924 or 1925, 26 by 36 inches, not very large. It has been described by one author as living graffiti. It has a playful sense of fantasy with a display of metamorphic forms, organic shapes, curling and chirruping with an elastic quality. Next, we have Rain Magritte, born 1898, died 1937. And the painting is titled The Fall. And it was done in 1953, 39 inches by 31 inches, not very large. It is a realist image, meticulously painted, bowler-hatted men falling from the sky. It typifies the surrealist love of the paradoxical, appearing real, but obviously it is not. Now we come to abstract expressionism the movement that followed. And the, move, the title was coined by a New Yorker magazine critic called Robert Coates in a 1936 issue. The phrase was originally used to describe Kandinsky's non-representational abstract work. But it was a post-World War II movement developed in New York and characterized by a desire to convey powerful emotions through the quality of paint alone, often on canvases of a huge size. Qualities that are basic to abstract expressionism, a preference for large scale, emphasis on surface qualities, the act of painting itself, and the absolute individuality of the artist. Now, not all works in that category are abstract, not all expressive. And by the way, no one artist can be singled out as the first abstract painter, as it has been documented that some artists resorted to backdating their works, I guess to be on the cusp. This painting is by, as you know, Jackson Pollock, titled Lavender Fields, Lavender Mist, sorry. And it's nine foot, nine feet, 10 inches by seven foot, three inches, huge. Pollock was famous for drip and splash type of action painting that was basic to the gestural quality of the work. These works were created not by painting on the canvas, but by layers of spattered, flicked, dripped, and poured paint applied with sticks and stiffen brushes. Pollock believed that the canvas should express the artist's emotion. So instead of painting images, the painting took a life of its own with the gastro actions of the artist during the process. Now we come to another expressionist, William de Kooning, born 1914, died 1997. Along with Pollock, he was a major figure in abstract expressionism, along, especially during the 40s and the 50s. However, unlike Pollock, he retained some suggestion of figuration in his work. 
representational abstraction. This is Woman One, part of a series of six, I believe, painted in 1952 or 53, seven foot by five foot. All teeth, an enormous bosom, like a predator. Painted with aggressive brush strokes, she is impressive and as much a tribute as a taunt. De Kooning's inspiration was the Mesopotamian figures in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, with their wide eyes and smiles, prominent breasts, and tapering arms. Next, we have something much gentler. This painting is by an American, Arthur Duff, who is acknowledged today as the first American abstract painter who did a series of pure abstract pictures at the same time as Kandinsky in 1910 and 1911. His early works were often based on organic forms suggestive of nature's rhythms, but in later years he experimented with geometric forms. The title is Nature Symbolized, painted in 1911. He simplified the natural forms and contours to build up a rhythmic pattern suggestive of nature's rhythm, rhythms. And next is Milton Avery, born 1885, died 1965. He used flat planes of color influenced by Matisse, but painted in an abstract representational manner, in an apparent naive style which often suggested a meditative mood. And this one he titled Spring Orchard, painted in 1959, 50 inches by 67 inches. Now, after the 1950s, there was a reaction to abstract expressionist movement and its perceived exa exaggerated and moralizing stance. And it took the form of airy, spattered, lyrically colored, light surface abstract paintings whose takeoff point was Jackson Pollock's all over paintings. These were the colorists and the artist who developed and practiced this was primarily Helen Frankenthaler, born in 1925, died in 2011. This is titled Wales, painted in 1966, four foot by nine foot approximately. She was a pioneer of the staining method on unprimed canvas using acrylic paints, which had been developed earlier. Acrylic paints became commercially available and they were perfect to use in staining as they lend themselves more readily to achieving transparent veil-like effects seen in diluted watercolor washes. You could obtain the same effect with oil paints, but it would have been a little harder. Large canvases can be stained more easily with acrylic washes, and when dry, the color was incorporated into the canvas, and it became the actual picture surface. And depending on that fact, color alone can communicate, if not meaning, then a sense of pleasure. Now I will move on to pop art, short for popular art. Popular, pop art emerged in Britain and the US during the mid, mid to late 1950s. And it challenged the traditions of fine art by including imagery from popular or mass culture, emphasizing the banal or kitschy elements popular as opposed to elitist, and often through the use of irony, and it is interpreted as a reaction to the then dominant ideas of abstract expressionism. Due to the utilization of found objects and images, it is similar to Dada and of course the urinal. Pop and minimalism are considered to be movements that precede postmodern art or some of the earliest examples of postmodern art. And there are familiar names here, Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, James Rosenquist. And the one who did this painting is Robert Rauschenberg, born 1925, died 2008. He was an artist who wanted to work in the gap between art and life, 
suggesting he questioned the distinction between art objects and everyday objects, reminiscent of issues raised by the fountain by Marcel Duchamp. And here I will quote what he said in 1962. I was bombarded with TV sets and magazines by the refuse, by the excess of the world. I thought that if I could make or paint honest work, it should incorporate all of these elements, which were and are a reality. Collage is a way of getting an additional piece of information that's impersonal. And he says, I've always tried to work impersonally. Critics have titled this kind of painting, Combine Paintings. And this one, painted in 1959 by Rauschenberg, is titled Canyon, and it's a collage. It is two-dimensional as well as three-dimensional, and the bird seems closed in by the walls of the composition, the canyon. Today, historians view combines with a different set of parameters because they used to look at those in terms of shape, color, texture, composition, and arrangement of things. But I don't think that applies here. So what do we make of it? The all-important label, R. Mutt, for example, on the urinal. How many times have you entered into an art fair and wondered whether that arrangement of crumpled paper on the floor in the corner was part of the exhibit. The only clue is that it didn't have a label. So, or maybe the janitor forgot to clean it up. The label carries sufficient information to start with. Artist, title, size, medium, date. Name of the artist, who is she, they. The title of the work sometimes gives a clue as to what it's supposed to be. The size, is it large, is it small, does it swallow you up? Or is it something you can hang on a wall? Is it an oil, a watercolor, a pastel, mixed media, collage? When was it painted? This century, last century, last year, last month? And finally, in what context did he, she, or they create the work? An artist statement sometimes helps. The more you know about the artist, his biography, her biography, the better able you are to form an opinion about the art and your reasons for liking or disliking it. Now I'll talk about your response. Do you walk by no longer interested when you're in a gallery? Or do you pause, stand back, and look some more? If you do pause to look, what do you feel? Do the colors repel or do they attract? Does the composition, line, shape, form, texture puzzle you? Or does it jog your memory somewhat and you are drawn to it? Your reaction to the art is a personal one and it's conditioned by several factors. Your taste in music, art, literature, your experience looking at art, your profession, your background including memories and experiences in your life play an important part in that reaction. Art can be read in several ways, emotionally and visually through our five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, hearing. However, your response may not be what the artist originally intended as illustrated in this drawing in the New Yorker some years ago. And this is called the skeptical view of nonverbal communication. Now, regardless whether you like or dislike the artwork, it has succeeded to some degree by getting you to look at it. One of the purposes of art is that it promotes dialogue. And it does give a different view of things, such as unmade beds, a tiger shark in a tank, wrapped buildings, not to mention scratches on a wall, peeling paint, muddy puddles, detritus of everyday life. Your involvement completes the cycle of artist, concept, process, product, audience reaction or participation. And you are part of the art in a way as that appears to be the definition of art today. 
And now I'll talk about two living artists, not dead ones. Anselm Kiefer, born 1945. He's a German painter who produces large, heavily worked canvases with objects, vegetable matter, metals, earth, paint, etc. Many of his pictures refer to German history, Nordic mythology, the cycle of life, growth, and decay. He uses unusual techniques to create works that have its roots in German Expressionism, which was a part of a larger Expressionist movement in North and Central Europe before the First World War. The label, Bohemia by the Sea. Oil, emulsion, shellac, charcoal, powdered paint on burlap, painted in 1996. And I took myself next to it just to show scale, so I didn't have to tell you how large it was. The context of this painting, of this immense canvas, is that it presents an isolated country road through a field covered with poppies. Associated with sleep and emblematic of military veterans, the poppies are described with paint drips the color of dried blood. The title comes from a poet about a longing for utopia while recognizing that it can never be found. Just as Bohemia, annexed by Nazi Germany, a landlocked country in Central Europe, can never be by the sea. Now I'll contrast that with one of my favorite living painter, Andy Goldsworthy, born 1956. This is titled Maple Patch, 1987, Japan. Goldsworthy works, well his works are often site specific and made mainly of found materials such as leaves, pebbles, twigs, stone, wood, snow, ice, etc. He uses no tools other than the objects that come to hand when he is on the site, whether he's in Iceland or Japan or Storm King in New York. Many of his sculptures are short-lived, they're transient. And as with all ephemeral artworks, they are usually documented as photos, sound, videos, text, maps, illustrations, etc. Okay, now we'll have a little fun. <laughs> I will show you a painting. I'll give you the name of the artist, the size and the year it's painted. And I'd like people to say something about this is by Helen Frankenthaler, titled Mountains and Sea, 1952. That's the artist, that's the title. The year, 1952, it was painted. And the size, 7 foot by 10 foot. This painting basically made her. When she did this, this was like really big. So it's a very famous painting. And I will read you the curator's note. It is airy, light-infused. It is an abstraction of a landscape. No lines, no brush strokes. Well, actually, I see some lines. No brush strokes, veils of color washes, evoking reality in spatters and blots. This is, um, I'll give you the title, I'll give you the artist, Paul Clay. Title, Winter Day Just Before Noon. Painted 1922, oil on paper. It's 12 by 18 inches, it's not large at all. So we're probably seeing it like 10 times the size. Comments? Clay stood outside the mainstream, but he was more, um, I like him a lot because it's fantasy, it's imagery, it's associative, and the key word here is association. So, winter day just before noon, you see the sun. And he was living, I think, uh, in Switzerland then, I'm not so sure, but this is an alpine landscape. You see the skeleton of a little pine tree on top of the mountain and the chalet. So, it's like, a, as the curator says, it's a warm, childlike environment in a magical place. The church, the sun, the pine tree, the alpine surroundings. And the church figured quite a lot in Clay's paintings. 
Any comments? It's childlike. Why could that not have been done by a child? If I walked in without knowing anything about art at all, I walked in, why would I say that painting is real? Because um, I have a book there, actually, that says why it couldn't have been done by a five-year-old. <laughs> and there are some books there that if any of you are really interested, uh, two of them are new. I bought them at the Metropolitan a few months ago, and one of them at the Bra, the Met Bra. They're about why a five-year-old. And it's basically, yes, a five-year-old would probably be able to put the, the church, the sun, but the, the whole composition that pulls together that gives you that sense um, might have been a little difficult because children would be flattening the colors. There would be very little tonality, flattened color, and they tend to outline. So yes, they might paint a... Um, there is a slight difference, and the only way you can put your finger on it is to know who painted it. Was it a child? Or was it... If you mistook it for a child's painting, that's perfectly all right, too. I think for me that's the basic question now, about all about all of this. I mean, we know if it's Brock, we know if it's Monet, Monet, et cetera, et cetera, because you told me that, because we know that. Uh, but if I knew nothing about art and I walked into a museum, uh, I guess for me I'd like, and this is it's a simple question with probably not a great answer to it, but I'd like to know why is this a great painting uh, and why is it because because it allowed, up to the period of traditional one-point perspective, um, the academies in France and elsewhere, you could only paint in one way. And Impressionism broke that taboo. And it just, this is a progression from what was originally a movement to get away from the restrictions of how one should paint and what one should paint to a total freedom. It's slightly anarchic. So with freedom came, well, what do we do? Let's look at what we did when we were kids. Maybe we can make it so that it resembles an honest way of painting. That was probably what they thought. That's my opinion. It's a progression towards freedom, a freedom to do exactly what you wanted, even if it looked like a child's painting. And if the people loved it and they could relate to it, which is what this is all about, because if you can't relate to it, that's fine. That's perfectly fine, because you're not supposed to relate to every piece of work out there. Not anymore. Yes? I think the... Um As children, we we just intuitively paint. Correct. That's and or or draw or do yes. whatever, and we create these images from somewhere inside ourselves, and they just come out on yes. you know whatever. But there comes to a point in childhood where we stop doing that. And Correct. It's because it's it's outside influences come in and tell us yes. we're not good or. You know, our friend yes. says something. And so as an adult, to get back to this point is extremely hard. And I think that's what people that haven't tried to get there don't understand. It's yeah, a it's question. Not easy to do this. It is also a question of choice. Because well, yes. there isn't just yeah. one way now to do art. There are so many ways. And every way is accepted today. It may not have been in the 1950s and 60s or 70s, but today, in looking back, and I think art stands, good art stands the test of time. Why do so many people love it? Because it has something in there that talks to them. I'd like to move on to the next. Again, this is a painting from the past, Juan Miro, and it's titled Woman and Bird in Moonlight. Painted in 1949, 26 by 32 inches. And when I showed it to my husband, he was like, well, what is it? <laughs> Miro, if you remember, was into fantasy. Slightly surreal, playful. The birds, you know, the, the red room. Uh, the red room was what Matisse did, but it's, it's kind of close. It's elements and drawings and shapes. And the curator's note here is that the, finger, the figures tumble together. 
The shapes move in and out of recognition as if they could exchange identities. You see the bird up there just by the beak, I believe, and the woman's head. It's a fantasy landscape. Anyone? Maybe that's what the world needed in 1949. <laughs> we wanted to paint the world the way it was. Right. After, after the decimation of World War II. Right. Which carried over <laughs> right. after that. You needed something perfect. Right. You needed something happy. Who wanted to confront and, and portray the world that the world I think was? it was escapist, yes. No, to me. in a good way. Maybe in a good way, yes. Yeah, in a good way, saying, hey, folks. You have to have a different world. You have to have a different mindset. Yes. But you don't have to like it. <laughs> I'm not an expert on him, but the reason I think they look similar was because he had this tendency to randomly, uh, shall we say, juxtapose objects, totally unrelated, simplified objects, outline, but the background always seemed to hold it together. And it was like a child's painting, yet not a child's painting. It was like delving into your subconscious and playing with things that obviously are askew, but in a very pleasant way. Because his paintings, to me, don't evoke the same kind of reaction as when I look at some of Picasso's. And yes, he was fairly consistent in doing certain things a certain way. And most artists, I'm, I will say this though, most artists do do a lot of the same things and they don't do it because in the early years, it wasn't because they could sell this piece so they could sell a hundred more of it. No, sometimes they hammer it, as I use the phrase, you hammer an object to death until you get what you can out of it. This is Rothko, Mark Rothko. The title, Orca. Red on red, 1954, seven foot by eight foot, oil on canvas. Comments? <laughs> yes, because it is big, but Rothko's paintings are very, um, there's always kind of, it always divides an audience a little bit because some people used to call that um, glo Rothko's gloomy colors. But I asked my husband, Bok, what he thought of this. He said, well, it's like sunshine coming through a window. So it, it's, Rothko was one of the colorists, and he was very, how shall we say, I would use the word pure. Because he would layer, these colors are not put straight on. They are layers and layers and layers put each time. And I find them calming. But as to what everybody else thinks, that's why it's up there. <laughs> so my last one is Robert Rauschenberg's Retroactive One is a title painted in 19... It wasn't painted, I'm sorry. It's a silk screen, 1964. Comments? This one, I couldn't find the size. I'm not, so, uh, but I think Rauschenberg didn't do extremely large paintings. Well, remember the year it was painted, 1964. And here, this painting always puzzled me, but I read up a little bit about it. This looks like Adam and Eve, right? But it's actually, Marcel Duchamp's uh, new descending a staircase that has been digitized a bit. The pointing finger of Kennedy, who had died by then, and the pointing finger of God with Moses. Very accusatory. Landing on the moon, I believe, right? The other associations? So, the curator's note was he applied printed images to canvas with silk screen. And there was a documentary flavor to his work and a sense of a flicker of a TV screen, of the media itself. The figures on the right looked like Adam and Eve, but it was a strobe, a strobe light image of Duchamp's painting, Nude Descending a Staircase, and Kennedy's pointing finger. 
liken to the finger of God, accusatory, vengeful. So on that note, if there are no more questions, <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs>